Good Thursday morning, brothers and sisters. Today I want to continue reflecting on the implications of the Ascension as we move through this final week of Eastertide toward Pentecost. But frankly, the morning has not developed as I expected when I was looking ahead to this message earlier in the week. This has been a hard 24 hours. Yesterday morning we got the news that a friend of several of us here in the um, Triangle area in North Carolina, a friend of ours, Mike Dune, Boone, had died from coronavirus. Mike was a young man in his mid-30s. He was a priest. He went to Duke Divinity School, and during that time he was a volunteer and part-time staff at All Saints in Durham, where I was the pastor at that time. And Mike and I had lots of great talks together and worked through some hard things in his life. Um, I loved him a great deal. In fact, all of us did. He was an incredibly loving, lovable man. About three years ago, he moved to take the position of the dean of the cathedral church for the ACNA Diocese of Cascadia. Tuesday, he had been running a low-grade fever, and then that night, the fever suddenly spiked up, and within a short time, he asphyxiated and passed out. He was with his girlfriend when that happened, and she called 911 and administered CPR, but by the time the EMTs got there, he was gone. Then late yesterday afternoon, about eight hours later, we got word that Sally's stepfather, Reese Bricken, had died from complications of coronavirus. He was in the hospital, put in the hospital last Thursday with a persistent cough. Over the weekend, he developed pneumonia, and he rapidly declined and went to be with the Lord yesterday. Uh, Reese was the next to last member of our families from the great generation. <clears throat> he had been married to, his, to Sally's mother for over 15 years when Sally's mom died in 2017. And the heartbreak of it is, is that like so many of us in this time, uh, so many in this time, Reese died alone without any of his children or stepchildren near for those final days of his life. So we just experienced two tragedies of the pandemic yesterday, sudden death of a young man in his prime and the lonely death of an older man who deserved, in a sense, better. Uh, there are countless ways in which human beings die that are heartbreaking. Uh, wars and violence and crime and hatred, uh, bloodshed all over the place. Uh, sudden tragedies and accidents that happen to us out of nowhere. Rapid, unexpected illnesses like Mike or long illnesses with much suffering. How many people die alone, unnoticed, forgotten? I could go on. Few of us really get to die in a Hallmark movie. There's this great move in our culture to see death as simply a natural process. Like we die like a stately tree after it's lived its time or maybe you want to imagine we're like a mayfly with its ephemeral glory that just comes and goes so quickly. We no longer have funerals, we have celebrations of life. Now, I'm not trying to belittle the efforts to focus on the good of a loved one's life or to celebrate the memories that are beautiful and humorous and good, but we have shifted decidedly toward an idea that death is natural, that it's a friend, that death welcomes us at the end of our life into its loving embrace. Well, scripture paints a very different story. And it's emphatic that death is an enemy. It's a violation of God's created plan for, hum for the human race. Uh, Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Death was not something he was eager to go into, but he submitted to. And the fact that so often the handmaidens of death are suffering and pain and shame and loneliness and tragedy and grief tells us something that we cannot forget, that we are not made for death but for life. The gospel offers the promise of life that ends not in death, but that declares that life, new life, eternal life is ours freely and fully through Jesus. The ascension fixes the true ending of this life in our minds. On the other side of the death of Jesus is the glory of Jesus. Life conquered death. Light dispelled the darkness. Glory was swallowed up, excuse me, was glory swallowed up shame and tragedy. 
the bitter and the dark were incorporated into the fabric of the triumphant mercy and grace of God. When we receive Jesus and believe in his name, his life is born in us. A process of transformation and growth begins. And on the other side of our death, what we see is the completion of our own growth into the fullness of the glory that God has waiting for us. We pass through death and are welcomed home by that glorified, ascended Jesus. One of the primary implications of the ascension in the New Testament is that it should shape our choices in this life. And the simple idea is this, that where we are heading and what we shall be shapes how we live now. So we live now in ways that we are becoming increasingly who we really are. And that's just laced throughout the entire New Testament. We've been in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says this in verse 8. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Make, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says to, and really to us, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Because Jesus is shining. He is ascended. He's in glory. Colossians chapter 3 says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then comes a long list of sins, sensual sins, sins of the mind, sins of the heart. Put them to death. 1 John chapter 3, I think, shapes this in a way that is so compelling and encouraging and directive to me. I've clung to this all my life. Chapter 3, verse 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. So we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, of course, the obvious application in all of these passages is to our moral and ethical choices, our battles with temptation and sin, our battles with the flesh, our battles, battles with pride, the pride of this life, the lust of the eyes. But in those battles, what I hope we will fix on more and more is that this, our path is a road of ever-increasing glory and light. We are walking toward the ever-brightening dawn, Proverbs 4.18. We are headed for the celestial city to be welcomed home by a host of people in festival garments, a party, a celebration of joy. Therefore, in this day, in this life, we are not called simply to lives of sin management, but of genuine freedom and transformation and increasing glory. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, through eyes of faith, we behold you now in your glory. May we live daily in the light of your glory and in keeping with your promises of glory that we will someday see and share with you so that when we depart this life, we will hear your loving words, well done, enter into the joy of your master. This day you shall be with me in paradise. O oh Lord Jesus, remember us, your servants, when our tongues cannot speak, when the sight of our eyes fails, and when our ears are stopped. Let our spirits rejoice in you and be joyful about our salvation, which you, through your death, have purchased for us. Amen. 
God bless you as you fix your eyes on the ascended Jesus and live toward what and who you really are. Amen.